When you retire, you may get a chance to go to football heaven. This is football heaven. Hello, guys, and welcome to The Mission. I'm your host, Jameer Howardson, and as we continue to celebrate Black History Month right here on The Mission, today we get another opportunity to talk to the first. And it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to pioneers, legends, African-American legends and pioneers that have been impacted by this game of football that we all, we all know and love. But today here on The Mission, we're speaking to the first president CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America in its hundred years of existence. The first African-American president, Mr. Artis Stevens. How you doing, sir? Jameer, thank you for having me on, man. I am excited and it's just so great to be on with you and uh, to talk a little bit, man. So I appreciate it very much. Artis, you know, um, Earlier this week, we had a chance to catch up with the first African-American punter kicker in the history of the NFL, Mr. Greg Coleman. And it was great to talk to him because, you know, he explained to us while there have been other quarterbacks and wide receivers that have played the game that have kicked, but he was the first to be drafted. Mm -hmm. And when you think of that and the yeah. impact that you have and your vision and your legacy on big brothers, big sisters of America and its hundred years of existence to be the first. Yeah. First and foremost, happy Black History Month, but you are making history, sir. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. And, and, and I appreciate that, but I, but I have to tell you, right? When this is, it's so surreal to me to, to think about it and think about you know, a little black boy growing up in, in, in Brunswick, Georgia, small town, Georgia, uh, and having this opportunity uh, to, to break barriers, right? And, and I'll tell you, Jameer, I've, and I've shared this before that, you know, there's sort of three things, three feelings, right, that I feel inside um, about this moment and about this opportunity. The first one is pride. I feel pride to be able to represent my family, to represent my community. Knowing I didn't come from a community with a lot, a lot of resources, a large family, the youngest of eight kids, right? I woke up a lot of days with feet in my face <laughs> because we're sleeping, you know, upside down in beds and stuff like that. And to know, you know, that, that I'm in this place because of people like that who supported me no matter what, um, there's pride. And I'm thankful. That's my second feeling. I'm thankful for all the people that blazed the trail before me. I would not be here today if so many people before me, names that I know and the many names that I don't know, who paved this this way so that that people who look like me and backgrounds like me have the opportunity to break barriers themselves. And the third one, which is the most important for me right now, is this the sense of commitment. And that's commitment to all those young people out there from various backgrounds, of various diverse um, looks and appearances, but have the same and similar attitude and approach that they wanna break barriers themselves. And maybe they see something in me, maybe they see something in the achievement that I have here. And they wanna be able to break those barriers to exceed what I'm doing, exceed what you're doing, to ensure that they're break opening doors, breaking barriers and blazing the trail for more kids uh, and more young people in America as well. And that makes me proud to work for an organization like Big Brothers Big Sisters, because that's what we're all about, breaking barriers so that kids can succeed and achieve their potential. Well, speaking of breaking barriers, and because we're looking at now artists, um, a lot of what we're going through now is like, a, and I was speaking to our last guest, um, Quentin Williams, and who's a founder and CEO of D2C dedicated to community. And I look at what he's doing on the law enforcement and bridging that gap of that trust and that communication and those relationships. And I look at big brothers, big sisters, of America, the work that you're doing a part of the healing process, and you look at what we're dealing with with childhood obesity, childhood uh, 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 suicide and, and, and addiction. If you could just lay out your vision, the vision that you laid out to that hiring staff of, of, of what Stevenson is going to bring to, to, to the table with Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Could you lay that vision out for us, your mission? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jameer, sometimes to, to go into a vision, you have to understand your past, right? And for us, one of the, the most important things is understanding why we were founded. We were founded as an alternative innovation 
to the juvenile justice system, right? We were that organization that was an innovation in New York City that said, hey, when kids, the kids who were the most hardest to reach, the kids mm -hmm. who were mar marginalized, the kids who were underserved, the kids who were the most challenged that people gave up on, this was the organization that people came to and said, big brothers, big sisters, can you help us reach those kids? Can you help us create an avenue for it? You fast forward 116 years later, right? Think about what's happening in our country, a pandemic, economic challenge, social unrest, all the different things in terms of what's happening and the dissension that's in our country. But you know who's being impacted the most? Young people, everything you just said, their social emotional health, the trauma that they're facing, the educational gaps that they have, uh, the health disparities that they encounter, they need the organization and they need organizations who are going to put them first. And particularly when it comes to focusing on kids who have the most needs and been disproportionately affected. So, I mean, check this out. 71% of the kids we serve are from communities of color. That's been mm. more disproportionately affected, uh, not even before the pandemic. Pandemic has done nothing but exasperated that, right? 66% of our kids are from single family households. 23% of the kids that we serve have at least one parent incarcerated, right? 55% of the kids that we serve is cat cat uh, categorized uh, to be living in poverty, right? That does not in any way decide what their future is, but it is something that we know is an anchor and that we as adults have an opportunity to be able to help empower them to create a platform. So my biggest vision and the thing that I've been saying to my staff is that we have to remember who we are and at the core, we are a justice, equity, diversity and inclusion organization that's about youth empowerment. Not just simply serving young people, it's about empowering young people to not only be the idea of how they develop, but the change that they, they can make in their families, the change that they can make in their communities, and most importantly, the change that they have in their own direction to be able to impact their futures, right? We, as an organization, have that accountability, not to do it alone, because no one organization, no one person can do it alone, but our face is to say, we can be better partners with the National Urban Leagues, the Divine Nine, with corporate partners, with foundations, with government, to be able to build these ecosystems that young people can develop, grow, and prosper in much more, uh, much more effectively because we're doing it as a village. And speaking of those companies, teaming up with Centene Corporation, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, um, Strong You, Strong Communities. Let's talk about that. How how excited are you to roll your sleeves up and to come together and to bring your kids together with the gold jackets so they can learn and listen to those rich values of the game? And we're going to dive into that because I know you yeah. played the game and I know you've been impacted by the game as well. But how excited are you to team up with those organizations to really affect change in the community? Well, it's foundational, right? It, it, it is looking at a company like Centene. Uh, with this type of network. And it was interesting because I was having this conversation uh, yesterday where it's the opportunity to build models of partnership and learn from those models of partnership. So you take what, what Centene has supported us in and supported so many organizations and the strong youth, strong communities model and it allows you to scale those things, right? To learn from states of what are the best practices? What are the innovations that we're learning and how do you scale that? Now you overlay that with influence. Right? How do you get the level of influence, meaning voices that people see and know and are prominent? So when you take pro, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you don't get any more prominent than that. Man. So you know, from a, from a level of putting voice out there to make recognition in terms of what's happening in the community and that we can address things, for example, like 30,000 kids that are on our waiting list today. Right? Mm. We're not going to get at that simply by saying, here are all the things that we want to do. It takes volunteers. It takes people knowing about us. It takes models and role models joining us and becoming part of that partnership network. And when you have individuals who look at who, who look like the kids we serve, who understand some of the same issue, and many of the players are people that reflect and represent that type of journey and that type of struggle, it allows for that story to be even much more effective and even more powerful. I have to ask you this artist, what attracted you to this job? Hmm. Yeah, I will tell you, I believe it's my ministry. Um, I, when I was, listen, listen, I'm, I'm the son of a preacher. I'm the grandson of a preacher. I always tell people this story, Jameer, that when I was a kid, my brothers and sisters, I'm the youngest of, I was in a household of eight. 
I was the youngest as I shared, but all of my brothers and sisters had musical talent in church, except this guy, right? And, and one day I got up uh, and I, I gave a Sunday school lesson. And then all of a sudden everyone started pointing at me and said, oh, he's going to be the next preacher, just like his dad, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I went to my dad and I said, so everyone's telling me, I was seven years old, everyone's telling me I'm going to be a preacher just like you. And I'll never forget the words that my dad said because it's been my guiding light throughout my entire professional and personal career. He said, everybody has their ministry in this world. You have to find yours. And I've found my ministry and my ministry has always been about empowering young people. And that's really been my steps and my direction. And when this opportunity came up, it was like a calling, right? It wasn't looking at the next job opportunity. It was like looking at a mirror because I saw myself in the opportunity. And I think that opportunity helped to embrace me as coming, becoming an organization CEO and hopefully being able to take the organization in the direction it needs to go. I'm getting goosebumps because that's what I, 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 I was hoping and I was thinking in my heart of hearts, I was like, this is his ministry. This is truly his ministry, being the grandson and the son of preachers. What was that one or two Bible verses that your grandfather would, would, would give to you, man? You know, he's the griot of the family. So I yeah. know he was dropping jewels on you guys. What was that one verse for our listeners and viewers that are out there that can get some inspiration? What did he share with you? Yeah, yes, sir. So it, it was Proverbs 3, uh, 4, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all of our heart and all of our ways. Uh, uh, lean not to our own understanding and all of our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our path, right? It was always a sense of when you trust in your faith, when you trust in yourself, when you trust uh, in your spiritual faith, that it gives you guidance. It gives you a pathway. And then you have to work hard and you have to put in the effort to follow faith. So faith itself is not everything you need. You have to actualize faith by putting in the work, the determination, all of the effort to ensure that you're accomplishing your goals. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Pam Iorio, a legend, the former yes. CEO, president of Big Brothers and Big Sisters. If you don't mind sharing, what was that relationship like that you have with her? What were some of the things that she had passed along to you while you were going through the process of, of, of taking this job? Pam has been extraordinary. Pam's an extraordinary leader, uh, former two-term mayor of Tampa, of course. Uh, and I, I will tell you the, the, the greatest evidence of Pam Aurea is when I started this job, Pam not only called me, Pam, when I was making my transition into the job, Pam spent weekly meetings with me um, and just, just coached me and gave me so much knowledge, gave me so much insight, right? And spent her time, even over the holidays, to ensure that I was ready to come into the role uh, running and, and full running. And she's just been such an accessible person. And one thing that I've told Pam, she's not going anywhere. Right. So she may be retired, but I'm roping her in to continue the opportunity. So uh, we both love presidential history. That's that's one thing that we both found uh, that we enjoy just sort of reading up on and understanding. So uh, we said, one, we're going to stay connected because we're just going to be uh, talking about presidential history. Uh, and then secondly, talking about the future as well and talking about the future of this organization. So Pam is going to continue to be an advisor for me and the work that I have ahead. And I'm glad that she's a partner. How much did um, your in your in your former uh, position as senior vice president and CMO, chief marketing operate operation operator uh, for National 4-H Council, help you um, as you're embarking in, in this new career? Oh, it was extraordinary, right? Because what what it what it does, Jameer, and and, and and I'll probably back that up a little bit. When I think about every step in my career, and I, and I always say this to to professionals who are coming up, right? It is about taking in everything that you can mm -hmm. to learn and develop your skill set. And that's the same as an athlete, right? right? It is, don't say, and I know it's easy to say no to opportunities. And sometimes it's sort of like, uh, well, I don't feel like doing this. What I told myself is the only way I'm going to learn is I volunteer for that thing that no one else wants to volunteer for, right? That I understand where my strengths are and I accentuate those strengths, but I also understand where my blind spots, blind spots are, where my development areas and my growth areas. Life is so similar to, to playing ball, man, that it, you learn so much in that course and in that process. And then for me, whether it was becoming a CMO and for the first time and saying, 
here's where I need to hone my skills in terms of looking at business plans and understand how do you really think about uh, profit margins and, and, and words that from a business modeling that you need to understand as a CMO, that how you read a financial sheet. It's not all about the creatives, right? And creative development and the advertising and communication, but you gotta understand some of the other things that are the undergirding of how you manage money, how you manage people, how you think about operations. And all of those things put me in a place in a position so that when that, that calling came true, when someone called on me and said, hey, we want you to think about this opportunity, I was ready, right? It wasn't a question of me needing to hone the skill. It was because I did all of those things before that allowed me to get to the place that I felt like I was ready. And then in 2018, you were the marketer of the year. Was that a, a, a sense of gratitude, thankfulness of my team? And this is what we did as a, as a unit? It always is, right? You, you, you know how this works. You never get there alone. You, right. you always... You know, I, I believe in the concept of servant leadership. If I'm doing my job right, my, my people are shining. Right? That's, that's who really should be shining. These, these old models of being in the front of the line or this, this great leader from the hill, to me is a concept that's like, like yesteryear. You know, to me, the concept is the, the greatest leaders, when you really look at them, they're not the people that you see always up front. They're the people that's lifting people up so that they're elevated. You know, they may even be in the back of the line, sometimes in the middle. You may not even recognize them because they've done it so well that their people are flourishing. And then I have to say one more thing, which yeah. is why, why all of this success for me has been really important is because I have a great leader in my home life, right? I always call my wife the CEO of my household, right? She, she leads all of us, me and my girls. So you know, from an executive standpoint, I'm learning from the best executive in the world because I live with her and she's teaching me every single day uh, because I say all the time, she could be in this chair just as much as I could. You know, I was talking to your team when we had our pre-meetings. I was like, I'm a little nervous, man, because I'm like, they're like Barack and Michelle. I mean, it's, it's real, <laughs> Dr. Stevens. And, and, and I mean, he is the first CEO president in like, I mean, whoa, hold on. I, I, I got to come correct. Like, this is serious, man. No, I, I really, I really, you know, I don't have two girls. I have one girl. So I know what it's like to have a daddy's little girl. Um, you know, I want to just take a couple of steps back, like just for yourself. Are you finding it hard? The challenges? Are you seeing it? I mean, firsthand at home? Like, how is everything with you as far as with your kids and homeschooling and things of that nature? Or, 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 or are they in school? Yeah, they're, they're going half time, right? Okay. And, and it, it is, I mean, it's challenging for kids overall, right? It, right. They've experienced things uh, that a lot, most kids in the country are experiencing, which is social isolation, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they're with their family, right? So even that they're, they're disconnected from their friends, they're disconnected from other mentors and people in their lives that, and their family that they want to be connected with. It's been good for them to go back uh, to school at least half time Yes. So I've seen just how much they've grown and they're developed uh, over that time frame. But you know what it also makes me think about too, is it makes me think about as fortunate that I am, right? There's so many other people that's not that fortunate, right? That and so many kids who their parents, it's not that their parents are not there, their parents are trying to work. You know, their parents are trying to do things that they may not just have the time to be able to extend to all the kids that they may have in their household or even the kids that they have in their household. So they're trying to make ends meet and then you have a child over here that's challenged because maybe they don't have the auntie network, right? Maybe the family is in a different location. Maybe they, they're trying to be careful because they don't want to spread anything in terms of COVID. So right. the kid is being affected. And, and again, going back to what Big Brothers Big Sisters does, when you have those types of relationships that you can bring into the equation, it helps to support where some of those boys may be. It's never going to replace a parent. We are never trying to do that. What we are trying to do is to be a partner and a support that we can help support parents, support schools, support communities in terms of having that important one-to-one -one mentoring relationship. Wow. Amazing. Well, I want to take a trip down memory lane, man, and I really want to dive deep and, you know, hear some of those old great gridiron stories because, like I said, I did my homework and talking to your team, you know, I, I, I thank God we know what the calling is now and you're living yeah. in the grace. However, yes, however, sir. 
I heard somebody was that dude Friday Night Lights. Let's talk about South Georgia High School. Hey, so so Glen Academy Red Terrors, Brunswick, Georgia, right? Um, by the way, my team competes uh, like almost every year. They, they're in playoffs or or uh, competing for state championship. So we got some. So just just so y'all know. We got some dudes down there in Brunswick, Georgia. So anybody who's sleeping on Brunswick, Georgia, I'll need to make sure y'all checking it out, right? Because we got some real dudes down there. Um, so yeah, when I played ball, man, I, I was a running back and um, I, it, it was my life. I, I will tell you, it was my absolute life. I had in my mind, I was in my junior year, I had in my mind that, listen, I'm going to, to play ball um, at, at division one level. Um, I, I had it all planned out. I was, you know, doing everything you're supposed to do, right? You know, working hard, particularly on the field, right? Um, and when I'll never forget, it was it was in my junior year, in the latter stage of my junior year, that I was at the five yard line making a cut, and then uh, two guys tackled me, one from the top, one one at the bottom, and I just heard something say "crack," right? And and I didn't even hit me at the time, right? That there was <laughs> there was this major injury that I had, and and then I, it's when, you know, everyone, you know how it works sometimes. Everyone started coming around saying, yo, you know, come out, come out kind of yeah. thing. And I'm still in shock. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm about to get up. Right. And then I look and, I, and then that's when you see it and you see your leg is not in the right place. Right. And then you see this thing happening. And then you're so sort of like you go in shock like, oh, something's wrong. Right. And, and then it's when it's all hits you and it sort of goes down with so many athletes, of course, go go through. You know, at the time when I was coming up, we didn't have the type of technology that you had then. So I never had the same push when I came back. But what it did, it did two things. One, I, I went into this whole mode of going inward, right? So that sense of depression, because I put everything in my life, I thought that is what defined me first. So I went into this sort of stage of, of, of like, I didn't even know at the time, but this mild depression, right, that I went through and everything was sort of my world had just crumbled down. And I thought I was down in this deep place. And I'll never forget that that's when the village came around me. That's when my village of mentors came around me. Yes, my family, but it was my coaches. It was other people from, from the youth programs that I was involved in. But I had people to pick me up. And the most important thing that someone said to me was that this doesn't define you. This is not who you are. It's only what you did. It's not who you are. So they said, get up. Get up, use the characteristics, everything that was about you that pushed you so hard to play ball, find another way, find another route, right? So my goal was to go to the University of Georgia and play ball at the time. I still ended up going to the University of Georgia just academically because I told myself, I'm gonna push myself just as hard academically because people were behind me. And I became the first in my family to go to college because I knew that that route, that road I wanted to take was not gonna be defined by me being an athlete. It was gonna be defined by me being who I was as a person. And that was only attributed to being an athlete as well as a scholar. So um, it's a story, man. And, and, and I, we can talk for days on that kind of stuff, but it taught me a lot in life and it continues to teach me a lot, you know, as I share with others, share with my kids uh, and remember my own story that gives me inspiration. If you could define that values, when I think of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's values, that makeup of our gold jacket and that makeup of our staff, that of integrity, yeah. respect, courage, discipline, honor, excellence, what value would you say that you learned from the game of football, but more importantly, learned from that particular situation? Resilience, without a doubt. It's resilience, right? When, when you think about everything that happens in your life, and you think about all the challenges, and, and this is so important, uh, particularly for, for a lot of kids who are growing up um, and they're feeling like, I don't have a way out. I, I, I feel boxed in. I feel like everything is against me, right? The, the constant knockdown that sometimes hits you in life, right? And we all experience it in different ways. We all experience those knockdowns. We all experience loss. We all experience a level of grief, depression in various different ways. It's the sense of resilience, being able to get back up, to keep moving, right, that it taught me. And it's something that's so important for us to be able to empower young people today with, that they already have it innately within themselves. So it's not like we have to place it there. They already have it there.
our goal is to hopefully help to cultivate it, right? To cultivate it, to grow it, to help empower them to use it so that they can leverage it and know that they can do the, the, the most incredible things if they only just know that they have a path to get there. And that's part of the power that I feel that we all have as mentors to ensure that we're giving kids that sense of inspiration, that sense of igniting them to say, you can do it because it's already planted within you. You just have to keep moving and keep focusing on where your goal is and what you want to get to. Well, here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, those guys, those bronze busts that's in the, the room just right across the hall from me know all about what you're talking about, that resilience. And with that being said, who are some of the gridiron greats that you looked up to? So when you come here to Canton, Ohio, you can't wait to take your picture by their bronzed bus. All right. So, so, so let me first say, like, well, I grew up in Brunswick, Georgia, but I was in Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I was born. I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. But you got to remember, the Jaguars were not around when I was growing up. I'm right. not aging myself here, but I'm just saying. They were not around. It's all around. good. We, we, I think we're from the same, same generation. I, yeah. I'll be honest with you. I turned 50 this past year. All right. So, yeah, yeah, we're around that same age range then. Okay. Yep. So, so listen, I, 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 I could not tell you how much I love the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. Okay. Um, me and Joe Green, when like it was the Coke commercial, I have to say uh, it, it was the Coke commercial. So I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and I told my dad, I said, I want the jersey, man. I got to get the jersey. Then I became everything about Pittsburgh Steelers. Wow. Right. And that all, that just sort of anchored me. So, you know, Bradshaw. Right. You know, uh, the, the Immaculate Reception, you know, all those different things. Lynn Swan. Right. Yeah. All these legends, man, of, of Steel Curtain all these legends and, and me and Joe Green was sort of the anchor of that. But I'll tell you, as I got older and, be, and particularly when I started playing uh, ball and got to that stage, because I was a running back. So I was like, okay, so who do I want to model my game after, right? When I was sort of coming up and I was sort of going through Pee Wee and all that kind of stuff. Sweetness, man. Walter Sweet. Payton. Oh. Walter Payton was my man. I, I, I've always been a fan of Walter Payton and everything, not just the player. And this is what's so important about the Hall of Fame. And you were talking about those values, right? When I think about sweetness, when I think about Walter Payton, I think about the player, but I also think about how many times this idea of being the man of the year, right? Yeah. What he did for the community, what he did to anchor and how he treated the game with respect, how he treated people with respect. That's ball, man. That's football. Football is this sense of not just what you do to win games. It's about winning at life, right? And that's what I think that, that this sport um, and, and all of those who are around the sport allows for it to really come out in a way that allows players to be these advocates, to be these citizens, man, that's just doing incredible work in the community. And I'm proud to be a partner you know, with the NFL, the Inspire Change, uh, Social Justice, a platform and then partners who support us to have relationships like this, like Centene, who's just made and bridged these types of partnerships and these relationships to happen. It's just been really amazing. So lastly, before we let you go, man, we got to talk about expectations as we look at, you know, 2021 and, uh, and, and, and so forth and so on as we go on, you know, with this. What are the expectations that you have for yourself and your team as you grow, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America? Yeah, so, so expectations is, you, you mentioned one of the words, excellence, right? Kids deserve no less. So our expectation is, is the idea that we have to, we have big problems. We have big challenges in this country, in this world. We have to meet big challenges and big problems with big solutions, right? I'll give you a perfect example. 30, I mentioned to you, 30,000 kids on our waiting list, 30,000 kids. Most of those kids are boys, right? Who can't find matches. Right? because we don't have enough volunteers to get in. We have to have a bold enough effort to be able to recruit more men into the work that we're doing, right? to engage them, men of color as well, to engage them in ways to, to create these types of opportunities that they can come in and create these types of connection. That takes volunteer power, but it also takes investment. Right? When you go onto our site at bbbs.org, what you find and what you learn is that there are simple ways that you can engage. Sometimes it's, it's the simple way of just spending a, a few times a month, taking some time. Sometimes it's more skill-based where you can help to engage with a young person around a career or experience. Sometimes it's just you making and giving a donation that you can help a, ha, uh, help a match get made by our local agency leaders on the ground so that they have the resources to go out 
and do these times. And then other times it's advocacy. It's you putting your voice and creating a community through your social and your networks and your communities to bring more people into the fold and about the work that we're doing. So that's what I'm really focused on uh, with the team attacking this problem, attacking the challenges of kids who are facing so many social inequities and how do we level the playing field so that every kid has an opportunity to succeed and achieve their potential. Well, there it is. If you want to become a mentor and a part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters of America organization, excuse me, Big Brothers Big Sisters of America mentorship, visit now. What's that? What's that um, website again? Um, it's Marcus? BBBS. BBBS.org. BBBS.org. Great, great. Well. Artists, thank you so much. Good luck to you. I can't wait for us. I know we're going to be doing a lot of work together as we come with Centene and, and, and Big Brothers, Big Sisters and the Hall of Fame here. And I, I But I just really appreciate getting this opportunity to meet with you, talk to you, and uh, just be inspired today. So thank you so much for your time. Jameer, it's my pleasure, pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on and looking forward to doing much more work with, with you. The, Pro Football Hall of Fame, and of course, our partners in Centene. Artist Stevens right here on the mission. <laughs>